All right. Well, we're back. This is the Tour Res Covery uh, podcast. Uh, I'm Barry Botone uh, with the Tour Project. And uh, if we could go around the room, introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Darian Trabata, the director of Tour. What up? It's Tour Res, Resies. Uh, my name is Domingo Whiteman. I'm from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Mm. Been around mm-hmm. Sealand, Woodward. Mm-hmm. Mm. But I'm the uh, tour prevention and admin. This is Carmelo Ravellis. I'm the tour case manager. Mm. Mm. <laughs> First time <laughs> podcaster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> welcome, Carmelo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to see all y'all made it back. And welcome, Carmelo. Uh, would you like to read the Elders Meditation for today, Sir. Domingo? Who? Well, like I said, Pivot One Niaket. Uh, today's meditations for elders of the day, November 27th. We're still in the fall of the medicine wheel of the season. And today is from Oren R. Lyons. He's a spokesman of the traditional circle of elders. He says, the natural law is a spiritual law. Its powers are both light and dark. There are some characteristics that are ev- evident to the system which the creator made. He made balance, harmony, polarity. And in other words, every plus has a minus. Every positive has a negative. Every up has a down. Uh, Every problem has a solution. The spiritual law is the same. It has the light and dark. Both are good, so both need to be honored. Lessons can be learned on both sides. Yes, very true. I like that. You know, um, for me, you know, it was like... um, you know, whenever you're a child, you're, you're innocent. And as you get older, you know, uh, my choices are what put me on the dark side. You know, and uh, I became so used to that, that whenever, you know, things would happen to me, I have really high highs and really low lows. You know, and it isn't until recently that I've learned that you got to try to stay right in the middle. You know, you don't want them big, the the things that you can't handle. You know, my probably getting my emotions under control are probably one of the greatest things that's happened to me, you know, because I don't experience those, you know, high highs and low lows no more, you know. But uh, I, I can definitely see, you know, uh, after spending so many years on the dark side, you know, I was the type of person that, had lost control you know it was hard for me to do anything I could it was hard for me to do the right thing especially when nobody was looking you know so I kind of understand you know the part where you know where every everything bad there's something good everything good there's something bad you know so uh I I I try to remember that every day you know uh trying to maintain my sobriety you know trying to uh there I go with the, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just, it's just something that I got to keep in my mind all the time is that, you know, uh, for everything that I do today, you know, there's probably going to be a consequence for it, whether it's good or bad, you know, like it's just something that's completely always happening in my life is a constant reminder of, how my actions today will, you know, create a situation later on down the line. So uh, is there anybody else that would like to share on that? Yeah, like uh like like keeping it keeping it balanced and you know and I learned from somebody is like you are where you're at today is where, you know, my hell God wants you to be. You know, don't rush it, don't you know, don't you go into any more that you know you can't handle. And I feel like that being that light and dark, you just keep it balanced because you can see it. And, you know, you can visualize the, the darkness and the lightness. But, you know, you know, you make the right choice, the right things will happen. And so I, I think that kind of it teaches how, uh, you know, there's always uh, there's always going to be bad and there's always going to be good. So when you're feeling good, doing good, if something bad happens, don't get down. Don't um, don't give up. Because, uh, like you said, learn from a good uh, co-worker, Cassandra Frazier. She said, uh, she always, she told me that I learned something from her was it don't matter how much sobriety you have, how many years you could lose it easily, oh, yeah. anytime, anywhere. 
So I think that's uh, real powerful, you know, the light and dark. Yeah. Thank you, Domingo. Yeah. Anybody Ooh. else would like to share on that? I think it's um, for people to have the realization, especially, you know, ones that were in the, the world that you were in, Barry, <laughs> yeah. that um, a lot of them don't even realize that they're in, actually in a dark side. Mm-hmm. And it isn't until they come to that realization that there is actually, a, you know, a light side or a good side that they um, – try to find that balance and that's what I think we're trying to promote and that's what we're trying to do is trying to help them find that balance and so I think this meditation allows you know it shows a lot because without that balance I mean even us that haven't gone through recovery or anything like that and we still do that every day and um, I think it's really helpful to um, actually have that knowledge to be able to know that a yeah we have to be able to find that balance every day so we can continue to, you know, try to, you know, stay positive and mm-hmm. know where the negative is and um, continue living our lives. Yes, thank you for sure. Stay focused. Yeah. Um, I, I also think uh, it's uh, contagious too. So whether it's your experience, the dark or the light, uh, it actually will spread to your close loved ones uh, and everything. So like my upbringing... Uh, was mostly dark with uh, my mother's substance abuse. Uh, like So, like, my dad was my mom's drug dealer, and that's, like, how I came into the world and everything. And so it was super dark uh, for quite a while, and then it turned light once she decided to go into recovery uh, whenever I was about 16. And then that, like, changed my perception on substance use and, like, uh, if there's hope or not, because before it was, you know, there's no hope. Um, but once you see that one change in that, that beam of light, um, that's whenever you can actually start seeing, uh, how far that light goes. And so then it'll go, you know, to the next person, to the next person, uh, and spread just like wildfire. Uh, and so that's another thing to remember is light and dark are contagious. Thank you. That's a good point. Like what, it, uh, it's quick, a movie quote, what it being tell Batman? Say I was born and then he, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in the dark, <laughs> molded by it. Yeah, yeah. molded. <laughs> You've merely adapted. Yeah, yeah. You, you adopted it. I didn't see. I was born until I was already a man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> well, that, I, I like all for I like everything that was said here. You know, um, you know that I. I, I enjoy these elders' meditations every day. You know, um, at some point during the day, I look at these meditations, you know, and uh, I don't know, it's just easy. Like, you know, I woke up this morning and I started looking at my AA stuff, you know, my uh, 24 hour, and I, don't, I just enjoy like any kind of recovery. You know, it doesn't matter what recovery, you know, somebody, you know, it could be faith-based, it could be AA, NA, whatever it is. You know, uh, I enjoy all, any kind of, I'm for any kind of recovery. You know, whatever helps a person get better, you know. Uh, I think, you know, that it's just meant for just them, you know. And uh, I don't judge nobody on how they choose to recover, you know, as long as they're healing. But uh, thank you, Domingo, for reading that. And uh mm-hmm. Darian, would you like to explain a little bit more about what we do here at Tor? Uh, this question I always blink on because mm-hmm. we do we do a lot. Yes. Tor, Tor is everywhere. Uh, if you follow us on social media, you'll see that we're all over the place trying to spread the uh, the word of recovery uh, and then spread care for those that are not ready for recovery. Um, so that's through our harm reduction measures. So that's providing sterile equipment to prevent overdoses, hepatitis, HIV, all that stuff, uh, where it's kind of a controversial topic, but once people kind of understand uh, where people are at with their substance use and how supplies is not going to determine if they're going to use or not, it's going to determine how safe they are when they use. Um, And so, you know, then Narcan comes into play, and that's what we're known for, I think, a lot now is we're the Narcan dealers. Uh, and we've saved people. We've had people tell us that our Narcan has saved uh, their brother or sister's life or a friend's life. And so we love hearing that. 
Uh, and then through us giving all these supplies out to people in active use, uh, that kind of plants a seed of recovery in their in their ma- mind. Uh, and so they come to us, uh, kind of ask us for some help. We'll either sign them up with insurance, Medicaid, do whatever they want, uh, and then refer them to a treatment center nationwide uh, so that way they don't have to pay a thing. Um, and that's just us on the treatment side. Uh, for aftercare, that's where something we want to grow a little bit more. Uh, we do have our talking circles uh, and our talk space, which is telehealth counseling um, for people for free uh, to use on their phone, where they pair with a counselor, uh, get free therapy for as long as they want. Um, but we want to expand a little bit more on uh, Will Briety, and so that'll be our talking circles, hopefully. You'll see us expand westward to a Clinton office. I think that would be outstanding, so that way we can reach more community members that way. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much a little bit of what we do. We do a lot more than that, but I'm forgetting everything right now. Yo, would y'all like to add anything <laughs> on what we do over here at Tor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do. Was, you know, just doing a harm reduction. Uh, we do. We've got the vending machines in the casinos. So uh, Clinton, Hammond. With Tonga and Concho, so I think that's a big plus. Uh, like we've been refilling it here right before the holidays, and uh, you know it's letting us know that people are you know being safe and uh, staying alive, and you know planting that seed in their head that you know recovery is possible. That you know that you know because it's a hard choice for them to come up and change because it's scary, and when it's scary, it feels like that's it's a big change. That's mm-hmm. a challenge. Like yeah. You know, it's not easy. Everybody could do it if it was. So. But, yeah. Anybody else? Carmelo? Uh, also, you know, several of our legislators have allowed us to purchase fridges. And so we have Narcan fridges at all the mm, ERCs uncles. as well. Yeah. Shout out to some of our uncles mm-hmm. and some aunties. Auntie. 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 <laughs> not fridge yet. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. oh. Yeah, aunties. I'm not taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, so we're trying to make our way and um, just provide as much as we can, whether it's information or product. And I say product, but we mean Narcan and harm reduction. Um, so, but yeah, that and you know, Domingo does yoga for some of our clients. We have uh, great partnerships with a lot of different programs, so um, we're able to partnering do outreaches with all these other programs and departments. So um, that's pretty much everything, I believe. No, we still got more now. I just remembered. So Barry Barry has uh, Mm -hmm. broken into schools pretty much now Mm -hmm. uh, to educate youth on the power of choice and how, um, you know, if substance use does become a part of their life, it's not the end of the life because we've often, as we were kids, you know, our school programs would say, hey, don't use drugs or anything because you'll get addicted and then they would end the presentation right there. Um, but we're trying to change how we end that presentation. We're like, hey, there's still hope even if you do use substances. Uh, and, you know, we are that resource for that. Uh, and it's it's possible. So that way, you know, to be safe. Uh, and then as well, like if you do get a little bit dependent on a substance, you can still find help and we'll be here for you uh, to find you the care you need. Uh, And then also just this morning, we started uh, breaking into uh, HIV testing kits uh, for people to get from us uh, in the community. So that way they can see if they're, uh, you know, if they've contracted anything, whether from sharing needles or actually intimate contact. Um, And so we have at home self-test kits along with education for that, too. And if you need to book. Barry, you can contact him. At yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harm reduction man. <laughs> yeah, harm reduction harm man. Reduction yeah, man. Yeah. Harm, reduction man. Man. <laughs> harm reducing boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, yeah, you know, we we do do a lot here. You know, uh, we have all these partnerships. Uh, we, you know, we're definitely not scared to get out into the public. You know, uh, I like the way how I I can kind of see how I've grown, like as in like speaking. You know, um, that was like a challenge for me at first, you know, but uh, I don't know. It's like that that fear is gone now. Mm-hmm. You know, now I won't shut up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. I enjoy going to these schools. You know, um, I try to change the language on how we address these things now. You know, like the, the overdose thing, you know, um, 
with these substances we have out there today, you know, um, it, it definitely needs like the language that's used, you know, like OD, you know, uh, over overdose is excessive use with fentanyl today. You don't get to learn your lesson from that. You know, uh, I like the way that they, they, they call it poisoning today. And that's what, you know, that, that to me, that makes way more sense to re to talk about it as, you know, uh, people just try like a grain of salt of it and they're dying, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I like getting out into the community. I like educating people. I like just being able to be that person that somebody can relate to because I definitely have been there, you know, on my journey, you know, um, I just remember, you know, um, being addicted to heroin, you know, and uh, doing all these substances, you know, that, um, you know, it, it took me a while to, you know, to realize that I didn't want that life no more. So I tried to lead by example more than anything today. And, you know, I appreciate every single one of y'all, you know, y'all all play a big part in people's recovery. You know, we, we can't forget that either, you know, is that. You know, you have been that person that somebody could lean on and they can just be honest with you, you know, and no judgment going on whatsoever. So, you know, um, it takes it. it. What I have learned, though, about this is that I can't consider that my my recovery is by helping somebody else's recovery, you know, and that that had me thinking about. Well, how do I maintain my sobriety? You know, how do I stay in touch? Because if I don't take care of Barry, then I ain't going to be able to take care of nobody else. You know, so, um, you know, just don't, you know, Cassandra just got her year, you know. And when we went to the meeting, you know, it just felt good. I got to chair the meeting, you know, and it, it just feels great. You know, uh, when I was doing the talking circle, you know, uh, it's the meeting format was like AA, you know, so that, that really helped me out a lot, you know, and, um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately is, you know, how do I maintain my sobriety by, you know, because when, you know, we're most addicts are, we have a lot of empathy towards other addicts or other alcoholics, you know, um, and it's kind of like you do, you, you kind of, when they explain something to you or tell you about their situation, you, you kind of feel like you want to carry that load with them. You know, you want, you want to take some of the pressure off of them. You want them to feel comfortable, you know, and, uh, it, it can be a lot sometimes because there's some situations that you go into and you realize that until that person's ready, you know, that there's really nothing you can do until, you know, they take that step. So, uh, you know, I see a lot of people come back from California. I see a lot of people, you know, get back home. And, you know, that's good. They they completed a program. You know, they're back home. You know, and they're trying. Well, they got away from whatever it was, you know, whatever substance they were using before. They got away from it, you know, which is a big part of, you know, getting sober. But then I see them struggling when they get back home because they think they're healed. You know, they think that that's it. Okay, I'm 60 days sober. I'm 90 days sober. Okay, I'm good. Well, I know with me, I had a whole lifetime of using wasn't no 90 day program going to fix me, you know, wasn't no, you know, here I am two and a half years later and I still have to do what I did in the beginning. Whenever I don't feel right, when things don't ain't going my way and, you know, uh, these really high highs and these really low lows, you know, when I kind of lose touch with myself, you know, I need to I need to go to a meeting. I need to talk to my sponsor. I need to, you know, and luckily I'm I'm very blessed in that way because my sponsor, man, he he's a he's a hell of a guy. You know, and he always has time to 
stop whatever he's doing. And, you know, we just kind of do a little, have our little conversation. And no matter what, I always feel better. Even if we don't talk about anything that has to do with recovery, he just has that effect on me, you know? So, but, you know, it, it was him that was always getting on me about, you need to get to a meeting. You know, like, that was one of the things that we talked about when I took this job. Well, somebody else's recovery, you can't consider that that your recovery. You know, you have to, you have to get in there and do the work. You know, so... Uh, I feel really blessed with my sponsor. You know, uh, he he's helped me grow in so many ways. It, it's crazy. You know, so the freedom that I have today from working with my sponsor and working these steps, you know, I want that for everybody. You know, I remember when I got out of detox and, you know, uh, I had to go find a meeting. I went and found one. Uh, maybe a week later, I found me a sponsor in California. And, uh, you know, I, I was doing all these things that they said that, you know, cause it's a program of suggestion. So I'm doing all these things that I'm supposed to do. But then once I got it all in place, I just got real complacent and I quit. I quit going to meetings. I quit working these steps. I quit, you know, I thought just because I'm off the drugs now that I'm good, you know, I'm healed. I'm, I'm, I'm Okay. Well, life doesn't stop just because I got sober. Just because Barry finally decided to get his life together, life does not stop. You know, uh, and I went I went a whole year after I got back, and then I found me another sponsor whenever I got here. And, you know, uh, I, I can only just tell you that the freedom that I have today from – making those steps, you know, making things that were so hard for me to do because you, it was still hard for me to be honest with myself, you know, and I ain't going to lie. Like the, the, the best part about working them steps is this part called sex inventory. <laughs> and I'm not even going to lie about how I let, I'm so codependent that it took me working those steps to realize that's what kept me going back out as I would get in a relationship. And, you know, I was, I, was, I have a pattern of I'm selfish, self-centered, you know, that always comes first. I arouse suspicion. I'm dishonest. I hurt people. You know, I do all these different things. And then when things don't work out, I get back at them by going and getting high and drunk. And it took me working these steps to realize, to see that pattern. And I mean, and that's helped me so much to this day, you know, that it, it, it just completely, it completely changed my whole perception on life now, because I was a type that thought that I could not live life without, you know, whoever that, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, that one. Yeah, one. <laughs> Not a specific one. Yeah. Yeah. Just the one of the month. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, you know, and it and it took it took me working these steps to realize that. So then, I realized that I cannot put my sobriety in somebody else's hands. I can't sit here and be worried about what Darian. Domingo and Carmelo think about Barry or else I'm going to lose touch with myself and I'm just, then I become a people pleaser. And then that's how I lose touch with myself right there is I want to please what y'all think about me. It, it means more to me what you think about me than what I think about myself, you know, and it took me just attending these meetings, working with my sponsor and realizing that, this world does not revolve around Barry, you know, <laughs> and it, it, it did take a lot for me to realize that, but you know, uh, I see people, I man, I'll be on Facebook and see people in recovery, like just mad at the world because of what somebody else thinks about them. 
you know, and that bothers me because I'm like, okay, they came back home. They're definitely not attending meetings. They definitely think that they're healed because they got away from the drugs. Well, that's 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 a big deal. It is. I'm not going to, you know, say that it isn't. That's a very big deal. Well, how about we start getting to the root of all these problems? Because, like I said before, yeah, I was addicted to drugs and alcohol. But at the same time, I'm also addicted to the way that I handle my problems. And so if I can't run back to drugs and alcohol, well, how am I handling these things? You know, and that's what going to meetings, getting a sponsor, working with them, that's getting in my big book and reading, you know, um, it has helped me beyond measure. You know, where my life is today. I mean, before these thoughts, these words were not even in my head, you know, like, it's crazy because they have big words in the big book. <laughs> but, you know, to be able to sit down and actually make sure that I'm not just sitting there reading. I'm putting this stuff to use. You know, I'm using these terms. I'm using, you know, all this information that was just freely given to me. Somebody just gave me a big book. And the the solution that I found inside there doesn't compare to what anybody else can do for me but God. So, you know, uh, I hate sitting there or not. I can't say hate. I hate sitting back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like. I do man. not like. <laughs> I do not like to sit there and watch people <laughs> suffer after they've already gotten sober. You know, uh, all these codependency issues start coming out. You know, uh, because I'm sober, I don't want that to be a gauge on how I'm getting into relationships now. You know, I don't just because I'm sober, I think that I need to go spend all this time and effort that I put into myself and make sure somebody else is getting the, you know, the fruits of all my labor. You know, <laughs> like that's 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 another thing you know but that's a whole different <laughs> you know but selfish man. <laughs> yeah. but i mean it's just these are the things that people in recovery deal with you know um i i want to see everybody make it i i believe that we all deserve to make it no matter what you know uh what i found is people in recovery are good people they just made bad decisions you know so um it, it it just means a lot to me for to see people, you know, you don't have to go, you don't have to do what I'm doing, you know, find something that works for you. Find, you know, whether it's church, you know, try church. If you've never tried church, try church. You know, I've seen a lot of people get sober in there, you know, um, whether it's, you know, I just like AA because. Uh, all the meetings that you see today, uh, Heroin's Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, all these different anonymouses, uh, they all use the AA format, you know. And with me, it starts with drinking. You know, I can say no to drugs all day long. But uh, what I thought I never had a problem with was alcohol. But every time I got drunk, I had to go get high, you know. So with me, it starts with alcohol, you know, but... You know, I, I just I just want people to be able to find a way, find something that works. You know, keep trying to heal. Yeah, you completed a program, you're home. You know, let, let's go a little bit deeper. You know, let's put in a little bit more work. You know, don't don't get complacent. You know, don't get lazy. Because, you know, just like they say, my addiction is out there waiting on me to slip up. You know, it, it's just sitting there waiting. You know, he's out there doing burpees all day long. You know, he, he he's 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 getting swole, you know, waiting on me to slip up. Because I know the day that I do, man, I might not make it back. You know, that's just how my disease works. My I got a disease that wants me dead. You know, and so, you know, I, I keep that in mind. You know, I keep that thought in my head like you know um 
whenever I wake up and I don't pray when I first wake up, like my day just feels off. You know, like I got to wake up as the creator to keep me sober just for today. You know, and then before I go to bed, you know, I got to thank him for giving me another sober day. You know, so uh, when I don't do those two things, like, I don't know, it just, I just feel completely like something ain't right, you know. And uh, I mean, these are good habits to have. You know, these are the kind of habits that I want to have, you know, instead of the old ones that, you know, <laughs> that we're not even going to get into. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, that's the type of mentality that I, that I know I need to have because, I mean, what do I have to lose? I have everything to lose today, you know, whereas before, you know, I was in survival mode. When you're in survival mode, you ain't learning nothing but how to get the next thing that you're surviving for. You know, um, you don't learn no lessons. You, you're you not trying to improve on anything. You're just trying to get better. You're not trying to improve. You know, if I was out there hustling, you know, I wanted to be a better hustler. You know, so that meant I had to be a little bit more scandalous or I had to you know, run a little bit more game, you know, and I wasn't learning nothing. You know, well, today I'm not in survival mode. You know, I, I'm steadily learning, you know, and uh, I, I finally did figure out what credit was, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> still don't got it. Yeah, I still ain't got it. I know what it is. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's just... I just want to, like I said, I would, I just want to see everybody make it. You know, I'm tired of watching people who deal with the same sickness that I have come back and still struggle. You know, um, where I found my peace was I went to a meeting. You know, and uh, I, I just think it's the th the things that I did in the beginning, I still do today. You know, uh, what helped me get sober and stay sober, I got to remember that, you know. And so that's what when I feel like uh, I'm kind of getting out of touch with myself or I, you know, I need to get better. I mean, I go to a meeting, you know, and uh, it, it's great, you know, walking into that clubhouse and seeing my people. You know, and uh, getting nothing but hugs and, you know, handshakes and, oh, so-and-so ain't showing up. You want to go run the meeting, you know, and it's just it just feels great, you know. And uh, I've, I've really found that being able to go back and have that feeling and because, you know, it's it's very hard for a person to when you don't realize like these people are talking a weird language and you know, they're saying all these things about God and you know, like you just, I remember going in there and just thinking like, I do, what did I, why did I even come here? Like I do not belong here, you know, but I mean, what else do you, you know, I, I didn't have anything to lose then, you know, cause I didn't have nothing, you know, so I didn't even care. You know, I didn't care what nobody was doing, saying, did not matter to me. But, uh, you know, today, you know, um, the love and respect that I have for another person is only because I love and respect myself today. So, I mean, that's, that's been like a game changer in my mind, you know, is uh, hold on to that, you know, uh, build off of that. You know, find something that positive because like the meditation said, you know, where there's a positive and yeah. you turn that thought around and, you know, my mind works without I don't it doesn't need permission to think negative in my head, you know. So uh, it's been a, it's definitely been a game changer for me. And, you know, I just I hope one day we all make it whoever's out there struggling. Whoever feels like they're all alone, I mean, that's where uh, I think going to these meetings and doing that 
whole sobriety thing. That's that's what that's what made me want to be there is realizing that everybody in the room has gone through basically the same thing that I have. And that's, you know, where else where else are you gonna find a group of crazy people besides out of me? <laughs> you know? But uh what else do we want to talk about? <laughs> well, I like what um, one of your talking that made me think. Uh, you know, maintaining you know recovery. It's it's a uh, every day. You know. Oh yeah. Different day, same day. You know, different day, same day. But I, um, one of my nephews, he's a uh, he's on a used to be on the youth council. Uh, he's at Sippy College in Albuquerque. Shout out. But he he told me something last year. You know, because he talked about recovery and what I do and he, what we do tour. And he talked about, man, in a few years, I feel like there'll be... He, he always compares stuff to Star Wars, you know. <laughs> but he's like, man, in the future, I feel like there's going to be uh, je- like temples, like Jedi temples, training centers. And I thought about thought about what you talk about meetings when they get, when they come out and uh, they come out and graduate and they come home. Like, the meetings, they got to, you know, that I feel like they want to attend, they need to attend. That It's there. And what my nephew said, I felt like, you know, there's going to be training centers just going to be to help maintain and stay on, you know, maintain mm-hmm. sobriety. So I feel like that's what you were talking there. That kind of came to my head. About, yeah. You know, meetings. And I know my uh, my stepfather, he talked about, you know, it, it's up to you to go to the meetings and how, you know, how long you're going to go. And it's up. It's always up to you, you know. And I, I feel like that's a lot of maintaining and, and uh, that uh, mindset. Because that motivation, you know, it's not always there all the time. Mm-hmm. And I feel like discipline and maintaining it and expectations is a lot, too. So, yeah. You know, any kind of meetings, AA, couples, anything will help a lot. Talking circles. And then, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, like they say, iron sharpen irons. You know, right. um, I remember I, whenever I was in California, I tried to go to all these different meetings. And one of the, <laughs> I went to a codependency meeting and that made me <laughs> realize <laughs> that I'm like very codependent. <laughs> and it was crazy because I, <laughs> because I didn't want nobody else to know that I went to this meeting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but when I left there, like, I felt like I was, I was aware of what I was doing. You know, I mean, it didn't stop me at the time, but I was aware of what I was doing, you know, and I kind of seen the the beginning of the end, you know, of the situation that I was in, you know. So it it definitely, you know, I think about what I was doing in my addiction. I would walk all over town for forty dollars. Oh, you got forty dollars? Okay, I'm on my way. I'd be down like. <laughs> In fair edition, I'll walk all the way behind Montana Mike's <laughs> for forty dollars. Three o'clock in the morning, get a phone call. Oh, you on Stone Glen? I'd be behind. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll be. Give me like an hour. I'm 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 walking right now. You know, and it was like I'm willing to do all that for my addiction. You know, and uh, for me to use the excuse like, oh, I'm tired. I don't have time or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like none of that makes sense once I sit here and think about it. Like, like man, you could have made that meeting, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. or you, you need to be there. You know, um, it's just crazy, you know, that I can still, to this day, I can make excuses, you know, and I shouldn't, you know, because th- that program saved my life. That's how I feel about it is that working them steps have saved my life because it just made me aware of my pattern of how I'm how I'm doing things. And now I finally get to step back and realize that, you know, I was the root of all that, you know. My decisions were the root of every problem that I had in my life. And my only solution was to get high and drunk. You know, so uh, I like like you were saying, iron sharpen irons. You know, and uh, you know, I it is I can go somewhere else and talk about recovery, but you know, um, 
if you was a addict and alcoholic like me, you know, uh, I don't know how much a person can really relate to uh, seeing the world as I did at that time. You know, so uh, I definitely appreciate that. I mean, you know, I wish we had more meetings like that here in El Reno, you know, or Concho, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to work with whatever's here. And I've been going to that. I've been going to that clubhouse since I was like four or five years old with my dad. You know, so, I mean, who would have known that that place would have saved my life, too, you know? So I I enjoy, I enjoy, you know, going to the meetings. I'd like to, I feel like natives should fill up the room over there. There might just be one or two, you know, sometimes you might have four or five. You know, I feel like we could fill up that whole room, you know, and, um, Especially like when somebody comes back from California, I'll hit them up like, hey, you want to hit a meeting? Do you, you know, just trying to get a feel for where they're at in their recovery. And they're like, when I hear nothing but excuses and, you know, it, it lets me know, oh, they think they're healed. You know, so uh, good luck, you know, tell me how that works out for you. You know, maybe, maybe it has worked for some. You know, but uh, I know, I know that uh, you know uh, the numbers the the numbers don't favor us. You know, whenever we have that type of attitude and we're not ready to put things into action, you know that I guess that's the biggest thing is, you know, even though you get home or even though you have sobered up, that's good. That that's that's a big part of it. But uh, let, let's get to the root of why why these things came about. You know, how did, you know, and it wasn't until, you know, uh, I could blame all these different people for all these different years as to why I was in the situation I was. But uh, when you're dealing with people that have the same sickness as you, you know, how can you really say, oh, that's their fault? You know, they have the same sickness you do, you know. Um, and it it was just working a program that helped me realize that, you know. So I'm very blessed today. I'm very thankful that, you know, uh, coming from a family of alcoholics and drug addicts, you know, uh, me and my brother was just, we was just talking about that the other day, about how he's the oldest male in my family. He's only 47 years old. He's the oldest male in my in my family. Because all my uncles, my aunt, all of them are 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 gone, you know, because of drugs and alcohol. And that's crazy to me, you know, cuz I'm I'm talking to him like you know, asking him if he wants to go to a meeting or you know, asking him, you know, like kind of getting on to him, but then still kind of like you know, teasing him. And, uh, you know, it's like, how can, how can, I, I feel like, I feel guilty because he's struggling. You know what I mean? And here I am, you know, uh, I don't, I don't feel like I've rubbed it in his face, but, you know, I give, I give, I try to stay, say something positive that he'll hold on to. But then, you know, we're brothers, you know, I'm going to say something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say something that he, he isn't going to like, you know, and then. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, I kind of I, I kind of am glad that I, I can be. You know, somebody that wants better for him. You know, as before, you know, I looked up to him. You know, um, he kept going to prison. You know, he kept, you know, and I would pray for him. You know, I would, you know, but here I am following right behind him doing the same exact thing he's doing. You know, so now that 
my life has gotten a little bit better. You know, I, that's exactly what I want for him. You know, I, I pray for him every day that, you know, um, I don't want to be the oldest male in my family. You know what I mean? That's like the last thing that I want is for me to be in that position where, you know, he puts himself in a in a position where he's not going to be here anymore. You know, and that that scares me. You know, I, I love my brother. I mean, he's really my first cousin. But, you know, we were raised like brothers, you know, so it's just kind of like, you know, uh, if I made him do anything, I don't think none of it would stick. You know, say, oh, you can't stay here unless you go to a meeting. You know, that I'd probably never even see him again, you know. And uh, it's just finding these different ways to help a person realize, like, you know, I tell them all the time, you know, like, you don't even have to be a part of that life, but you're choosing to go back out that door and go and, like, be in that world again. Like, and I don't even understand why, you know, like, what are you getting out of it? You know, like, why even put yourself through any of that? And then, you know, it's like he could care less about what I, you know, I'm just <laughs> griping at him, you know, I'm just... <laughs> probably make him feel that big sometimes you know but that's just how upset I get with him because I just want him to have the life that I have you know but I can't force him to do anything I can't make him do anything you know uh all I can really do is just lead by example you know and just give him that option that when he is ready to turn his life over I'm gonna be right there and ain't nobody going to be cheering him on more than me. You know, so, it, you know, I, I'm praying that that day comes very, very soon, you know. And uh, is there anything anybody else yeah. would like to? No, I think you bring up a huge point about you can't force recovery because uh, we see that a lot uh, where parents or, you know, relatives will call us to send somebody to treatment for them. Uh, and that's actually one of the worst things you can do because you're then forcing them into withdrawals. Then they're already thinking about relapsing, most likely. Uh, and so that puts them at a very, very high risk of uh, ODing or anything like that. Uh, and so you bring it up that you can't force it is huge because you do, you just have to be patient because uh, it's their recovery, it's on their time, it's not anybody else's decision. Uh, it's if they want to and if they're going to stick to it. That's what that's what makes the huge change is um, it being voluntary. Uh, and so that's kind of like my thing with, uh, you know, court-mandated recovery or treatment isn't always the best option. Like it does work sometimes, but usually they just kind of jump through the hoops uh, and then go back to that, that yeah. life because they never really wanted to change. Uh, and so hopefully um, the people that are listening kind of, kind of get on board with the the idea that it is their journey, it is on their time. Uh, don't, you know, enable or anything, set boundaries, um, but don't force uh, recovery for that. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of the conversations I've had, like probably within like the last four weeks with people that have uh, reached out, is like they want to become, they want to be a normal person again. And to them, like being in recovery isn't normal. And I'm like, you can't be any more normal. And I'm like, and in order to establish that, you know, it's just part of your life again, like you have to be around people that are in the same area. And mm. that's why I, the first thing I always ask them, well, have you been to any meetings? And they're like, no, I haven't been in like six months. And I'm like, well, that's where all your, your normal people are. You know, all the people that have gone through the same stuff that you're going through, all the people that have the same kind of experiences. Everybody thinks they have all these unique experiences and they're unique to you. But I guarantee you there's people out there that have experienced the same stuff mm -hmm. and they can make, tell you their experiences and how they got through it. And it makes you a stronger person because you're learning from them. And it goes right back to our meditation today is there's always negative. There's always positive. So, um, 
but yeah, that that was a conversation I had with um, somebody, and I was just like, I was like, you have to realize that recovery is normal. Recovery isn't some unique thing. Recovery is just a different lifestyle. Just like every somebody exercising every day is a lifestyle. Somebody overeating every day is a lifestyle. Um, <laughs> somebody talking too much is a lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's just that's just the way you know. That's just. It's just a lifestyle for people. It's not. It's not not normal. It's just. A, it's a normal way of life, and it's just you came to that realization. You found that balance. You found that where you're, um, where you're positive, where you're trying to go towards, and you realize that you were in a negative. You were in a dark side, and now you found your balance. And so now you're getting to live what your normal life is now. And I, it's a realization that a lot of people don't have. And I think that's what we try to promote. And what we try to do is, you know, through your story, through Cassandra's story, through our stories and everything that we've been through, you know, we try to help people understand that. And for them to be able to maintain and be able to understand, like, you know, this isn't something, you know, it's like you said, it's a daily thing. I wake up in the morning, I pray, make sure that I get through that day. And it's a it's a lifestyle change, but it's a lifestyle that's not not normal it is normal and um there's just this bias and this this thing around it that are, you think that something is wrong with the people that are in recovery and there's nothing wrong with them you know they're just normal people <laughs> yeah for sure. that have made mistakes yeah so yeah i mean it, yeah it's definitely i guess all these stigmas you know all these stigmas around recovery you know and we could yell that's like a whole nother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's next podcast. Yeah. yeah, definitely stigmas, you know. But, you know, with me, it was like whatever it takes. You know, like I'm I'm tired of doing things my way. My way, I'm, I'm, I'll go stay under a bridge. That's my best thinking. Go stay under a bridge so, my, so nobody knows you're drunk and high. You know, I ain't even got to live under there. I got somewhere to live. <laughs> but that's my best thinking. That's where my best thinking puts me. So my thing was, okay, we tried it my way. You know, things got real ugly, real fast. You know, so uh, let's try this way that does work. You know, let, I see these people at these meetings. They're all happy. They're all, they're telling me they love me. Don't even know me. You know what I mean? Like telling me they love me, you know? And, you know, that, that just made me realize, you know, that my family did love me for all these years, love me through thick and thin until I was ready to figure out how to love myself. You know, so that was like a very big part of, you know, and even when you get, you know, you do the PRSS training. They find that the connection that you have, you know, that's that's part of the reason why I ended up in the places that I did. I'm really to I'm re I'm more than willing to disconnect all these different connections that I have from people that love me because it makes me feel guilty. You know what I mean? Like, it makes me feel bad. I get to see what kind of person I am when I see my mom and I'm high. You know, like, it just makes me feel like nothing. You know what I mean? Like, like damn, you feel like the biggest disappointment ever, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it's just, luckily, I can use these things that I have been through and that, you know, uh, Hopefully somebody does get something from what we talked about here today because it's definitely a struggle. It's definitely not easy figuring out that I'm self-centered, figuring out that um, this world does not revolve around me, you know, and uh, accepting the fact that, uh, like, what's normal? You know what I mean? Like, what my normal is... <laughs> <laughs> my world, like, it, it's not even, let's not even get into what my normal is, <laughs> you know, because, you know, what is normal? You know, um, 
But, you know, luckily I am able to, uh, I like to say recover out loud. You know, I want people, I want the whole world to know I'm in recovery. You know, I want the whole world to know that, you know, I did find a solution, you know, and it wasn't, you know, it was probably, you know, because I prayed for this solution. I, um, I was willing to put in the work to figure out this solution and I found something that works, you know, and, uh, I'm just trying to give it to the next person. I, instead of me just holding on to this and just, oh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm willing to reach back and give it to the next person behind me, you know? So, uh, you know, whoever's out there listening, whoever feels like, you know, that there's no hope, you know, uh, I promise you, if I can do it, anybody can do this thing, you know? And that's like the biggest thing that I just, I mean, I, I, I gotta, I gotta recover out loud. You know, I can't, I can't just sit back and watch my people suffer anymore. You know, um, that, that, you know, I'm not willing to accept that anymore. You know, that's not my life anymore. And I don't want to see one more of my people go through what I did. And I could, if, if there's anything that I could do, you know, uh, is definitely, you know, to help them realize that there is a way out. And I just want to see everybody make it. Amen. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, is there anything else that anybody wants to add on to that? I think, um, you know, maintaining and uh, my, my name Shem used to always say, you know, he got them little eyes watching you. And I feel like, you know, that's a big part of it too, is mm -hmm. maintaining. You got somebody always looking up to you and, you know, nephew, you know, your your own, you know, son or daughter. But um, I think it's just the biggest, that's one of the biggest things too, is when you maintain your showing that uh, what you're doing, because how we learn and what we seen, you know, um, like I seen my cousin OD in front of me, you know, that scared me from staying away from drugs, you know. So that that's kind of, feel like the eyeballs are watching and uh, mm -hmm. they, they know they listen they watching yeah so i think that's sure. a big part of it you know staying maintained because you you know fix yourself you know pray to my you know take care of yourself and then the others you know everything else will follow through for sure that's what i wanted to add thank you domingo you know mm -hmm. um you know i i don't know why i just felt like i had to say this <laughs> But, you know, I've been thinking about the lifestyle that I used to live and the places that I came from, you know, the all the crazy people that I used to hang around with, you know, and everybody was like in this street mentality. Everybody, you know, was part of gangs or, you know, everybody was, you know, just living that life. And when I think about it today, I can sit here and honestly say that the most gangster thing I've ever done in my life was get sober for my family. Mm. You know, um, the easy part is running. The easy part is getting high, getting drunk. You know, the easy part is uh, playing the victim. You know, the easy part is uh, not willing to stand up to these things that keep me going out, you know, uh, that's what's easy, you know. Uh, I know some people look at me and, uh, you know, they think that, oh, you think you're better than everybody. Oh, you know, or Barry Act Shady or, you know, he he don't want nothing to do with this no more. No, nah, it, it isn't that at all. It's just the fact that that's how I have to live my life today to maintain my sobriety. I can't have, you know, Joe Schmo just, <laughs> you know, just doing what he does, you know, because that's because he's trying to survive. You know, I'm trying to learn. I've learned from my experiences. I've uh, even after I got sober before and I was around that that lifestyle, it just was taking me right back out, you know. So now that I feel like. 
I don't feel like I've got a hold of this thing. I just feel like I'm aware of what's going on around me and people, places, and things. You know, um, I had to let go of those things, you know, and um, instead of being gangster for the streets, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gangster for my family now, you know, um, what, you know, just sitting here, I keep looking at that. That's my granddaughter's name, Alani, you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's what keeps coming to mind. You know, every time we get on these podcasts, every time we talk about recovery, she's like in the back of my mind. And I realize, you know, that luckily, you know, she's never seen a grandpa that's ever been, you know, high or drunk. And that's how I want her life to be. You know, I don't want her to experience those things that my kids had to go through. So um, thank you, everybody, for uh, Uh showing up to work. Uh, I'm still full from that turkey. I was going to I was going to take the day off, you know, uh, but I want to do the podcast rather than getting new eyes. Reschedule some things. (laughs) Shout out to yeah. you, medical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just an eye. So yeah, just an eye. Yeah. Still ain't gonna work, yeah. but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's not um, even gonna do anything for you. So. <laughs> it's a different color. So yeah, get it metallic. But uh, want to give a shout out to uh, Shine Rappaho Television. You know, yeah, uh, they're a big part yeah. of you know being able to come out here and do this. You know, uh, we really appreciate y'all. So I guess with that we'll close up. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs>